Hi, my name is Jim and today we're going to be discussing limits. And we're going to end up here uh, after this presentation with a very, very nice lead-in for finding derivatives. So uh, stay tuned. And to start with, we're going to have a, a relationship here, an equation y equals 3x. And given x, we can find y. And suppose x equals 2, then y equals 6. So that's not very exciting. So what happens when we get close to um, x equals 2? And that's the limit notation is getting close to. So if we took the limit of both sides of this uh, equation, we have the limit of y as x goes to 2 is equal to the limit of 3x as x goes to 2, and that again equals 6. Now for this particular equation, um, it's not uh, anything unique about it, but sometimes we end up dealing with equations frequently which we can't reach a limit or at which the limit is not defined. So in that case the limits become extremely useful. Now an example of that would be the equation y equals 1 over x squared. So looking at just the expression of the right side of the equal sign, we would say what's the limit as x goes to infinity. And what we would find would that would be equal to zero. Now that would be x going to infinity would be going out in this direction. In your mind's eye is what you can see here is that there's an asymptote which is going to approach zero, but it can never reach it with any real number, because infinity is a mathematical construct. But if we let it go to infinity, we could state that it would end up being zero. Now, uh, again, using the same um, uh, equation here, and looking at this expression again, only letting x go to zero, we get something which is completely different. In this case, we're ending up with, uh, if x were to be equal to zero, is a divide by zero, and that's uh, undefined. But as we get closer and closer and closer to zero, coming in this direction, is what we see is that the value of y gets larger and larger and larger. So as x approaches zero, y approaches infinity. So in limit notation, we would say as x goes to zero of 1 over x squared would be equal to infinity. Now we're going to be looking later at an electronic component that has a characteristic like this uh, only defined in quadrant one. So in some function, the direction of the goes to is very important. And an example of that uh, would be the equation of y equals 1 over x and then taking the limit of the uh, right side of that uh, equal sign, the expression y equals 1 over x. Um, it matters in which direction we approach a limit. So for example, if I were to say uh, what's the limit as x goes to 0? Well, x goes to 0 um, can be either a positive or a negative infinity. So I have to state which direction I'm going in and then coming in from the um, left side or moving to the right I would say x goes to zero with a little negative sign above it and that would be this trace where the limit would approach negative infinity and contrarily if I were to approach zero coming in from the right side x equals zero plus what I would get is positive infinity now, how do you know the way these are going to behave? I mean, we see two kind of similar relationships here, but the limits are very, very different. And the answer to that is, is have an idea of the way the, uh, the equation uh, or the expression is going to behave when you're approaching a certain number. Graphing calculators, math programs, and so forth can give you an idea so that you're not surprised when you see something like this where you need to specify the direction in which you're approaching the number of interests. Let's take a look at the uh, limits of the form 0 over 0. And to start with is I have um, this expression here. And it would be y equals, you know, for this expression, or f of x equals, but I'm not writing that as most limits in textbooks do not. And if we take a look at the numerator here as x goes to infinity, we're going to see easily that that's going to be equal to infinity. And likewise with the denominator, if we let x go infinity, that's going to be equal to infinity. 
So we end up with this very uncomfortable arrangement of infinity over infinity, and we would be tempting to say that um, that would be equal to kind of like uh, zero over zero. I mean, what does infinity over infinity mean? And in this case, it doesn't give a meaningless, a meaningful um, limit uh, idea of what the limit is. And this may, in fact, have a limit which is meaningful, but we have to do a little manipulation to get that. And that form of manipulation, if you run into anything, is divide the numerator and denominator by the highest power of your variable. And in this case, that would be x to the third power. And uh, for this example, it will give us a, a meaningful limit. So I set this up here, divide by x by the third, numerator and denominator, so I don't change anything. There we go. And uh, just pulling this one term out to explain the way that we get these numbers inside to be very clear is we'll take a look at 3x squared over x to the cube and then what I want to do is use the rule of exponents and move the x cubed into the numerator. So I end up with 3x squared times x to the negative 3 power. And when we multiply numbers like this with an exponent is what we do is we add the exponents. So that would give us 3x to the negative 1 and then moving that x to the negative 1 into the denominator will give us 3 to the x to the plus 1 and we usually don't write the plus 1 or the 1 behind a, an exponent but that's where uh, this term is going to. So if we end up dividing these out here as you can see here we end up with 4 and um, as x goes to infinity here the um, denominator of this gets larger and larger so the entire uh, term there gets smaller and smaller leading to zero and the same with this as x gets larger and larger the value of this particular fraction uh, gets smaller and smaller approaches zero and then in the denominator we have the situation here which is similar uh, in x cubed divided by x cubed simply leave us with negative five so when all said and done here is we end up with four minus zero plus zero for the numerator and 0 minus 0 uh, minus 5 for the denominator which gives us a limit of negative 4 over 5. Now if we were to plot this function we would see it would look something like this and then approach negative 4 fifths down in quadrant 4. Now my orange marker here got a little bit thick and I'm actually touching the line but it should not. This is an asymptote which means it gets close to negative 4 fifths but never never gets there. So come across an equation like this relatively straightforward task of dividing numerator and denominator by the largest power. Now this is an interesting problem here and uh, we're going to be taking the limit as x goes to 3 and what we can see here is we're going to end up with a divide by 0. So uh, what I've done is factored this numerator down into x minus 3 times x plus 3 divided by x minus 3 and I was careful to write these over each other which will help us get an idea of what's going on. So um, dealing with this term right here is what we can kind of see with this is that as long as we don't end up with a divide by zero this term is going to be equal to one. For example suppose that this is 2.9 and this is 2.9. 2.9 divided by 2.9 is one. Suppose that this is 2.99999 and this is 2.99999 we end up with a uh, value of 1 when we divide those two together and then likewise what I could say is um, suppose that this value is 3.0001 and this value is 3.001 again this term is equal to 1 so um, what we can do then is evaluate this here for points uh, up to x equals 3 and any point that's not exactly equal to x equals 3 is defined. So what we would say here is the limit as x goes to 3 would be 1 times x plus 3, this is 1, which equals 6. And then at the exact value of x equals 3, it's undefined, and I've shown that here by a little 0. So um, again, it's undefined at x equals 3 exactly. It's defined for x equals 2.999, repeat forever. And it's also defined for x equals 
whole bunch of zeros, one. Um, so we have two, one, one place where it's not defined and every other single thing is. So that's kind of an interesting um, arrangement here is where this line can be very, very straight, just getting an undefined here, and then to continue on. And then this would be the intercept of that, which would be uh, 3. So um, if we were to factor this, we would end up with, um, well, just dividing these two out, we end up with x plus 3. And uh, this is defined, and as we can see, that that equals 6 everywhere. It's defined everywhere. So the question is, and I suppose that math people would be very concerned about this, is, is this equal to the factored version here? For electronics, I wouldn't worry about it because x equals 3 is really an infinitely small number relative to all the other numbers. And we're basically have values that are 5% resistors and noise and power supplies and so forth. How likely is it that we're going to hit 3.00 out to infinity and cause a problem in a circuit? So <clears throat> that I thought was an interesting problem. Now, um, leading into derivative, derivatives, and uh, derivative means rate of change, and that's very important in electronics. And we're going to start out here with tangents. And there would be helpful. So um, some components uh, like op amps have a limit on how fast they can change, how fast the output can change, and it's not instantaneous. So we're going to try to represent this a little bit uh, using slope notation. And uh, I started out with a sine wave, uh, just so we could kind of see something here. And in a sine wave, the fastest rate of change, which is going to be important in a little bit, occurs at the positive and negative going crossovers, and I didn't show the negative one. So if I wanted to see what the rate of change is, and that's simply the slope m, um, at um, the crossover point, I would just pick a point y2, and this is a corresponding, corresponding is an important word, x2, y1 and the corresponding x1, and then draw the tangent line, and then all I have to do is find the slope of that, and I'll have an approximation for the rate of change at the point of the crossover. So, uh, just reviewing a little bit, m equals rise over one, run, and I have interchanged the normal mathematical form here, which is um, y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1, because it really doesn't matter. The signs will work themselves out anyway. And then later I expand on this a little bit. But in the numerators, what we're looking at here is basically a delta y divided by a delta x. And if I had values here, I could pick a whole bunch of values, which would also give me the estimate, the tangent line, and it is an estimate, it's not exact, for what the slope would be, which would relate to the rate of change in volts per second. So uh, it all comes down to this, and then what we're going to do is migrate into something I think is really cool. So um, in our application of electronics, x would be the t-axis for time, and then y would say be the v-axis for voltage, or possibly the i-axis for current, depending upon what we're, uh, what we're interested in. So it's all about finding the slope. And the question that poses itself is, what would happen if the delta could be made to go to zero? Now what that means is, is if I took these two points and slid them closer and closer to the actual crossover point, the tangent line, if I didn't draw it with a big old thick magic marker, would actually be approaching the exact value of what the rate of change is at that point. Tangent lines are estimates. So that's what we're going to try to do is see what happens if we can get that delta to go to zero and end up with an exact value for the rate of change. And remember, as we move forward, this all kicks off from M, rise over run. Nothing more to it than that, except we're going to be using slightly different notation. So, since the, uh, taking the, finding the derivative of sine waves using that requires a double angle rule, we're going to move back into polynomials because it's a lot easier to understand. 
And what I've got here is a y equals x squared. It's a little bit busy up in here with the, with the ink, but what I want to do is find the uh, value here at um, uh, x equals uh, 2. And uh, this would be the 2 here. I didn't write it down because I've got enough stuff written down. And this would be a 4. 2 squared is 4. And then I'm going to pick a point above it and a point below it. So the point below it I've called y1 and that corresponds to value x1 and the point above it is y2 with the corresponding x2. So again I state m equals rise over run y1 minus y2 divided by the corresponding x1 minus x2 and uh, again as the delta on this would go to zero meaning these two points would be closer and closer the tangent will be exact um, if we could draw an exact tangent but the mathematical approach will yield a number which is exact. So um, what we're going to do, and this is kind of an important change here, is instead of calling this um, y1 and y2, is we're going to refer to this point as the function of x, which is the same as, in the example I used here, y1. And the second point is we're going to refer to as x plus delta x, the function of x plus delta x. So remember that the function of x in this case is simply equal to y, and the function of x plus delta x is going to be this guy plus a little bit. Now, if we project this um, uh, downward, what we're going to do is uh, be able to see that what we're talking about is a delta x between these two points. Now, Unlike this, where I picked a point above and below the point of interest, using this technique, I can pick the point of interest and then a little bit of an offset. doesn't matter because as my delta x goes to zero, this point slides toward this point, and this point doesn't have to move because that's our, our value. So what we're going to do now is just exchange in our equations f of x and f of x plus delta x for y1 and y2. And then in the denominator of that we'll have our delta x. So breaking that down a little better here is we've got y1 minus y2 and I have f of x and f of x plus delta x and then the denominator is x1 minus x2 um, and um, I can kind of see from that that this is basically the exact slope equation. Now how does this all work out? This is the elegant part of this, is flipping this page over here. We see this form, and I'm repeating this a little bit, is equal to this form, y1 and y2, x1 and x2. Then, um, simply taking this and substituting delta x for the denominator, which is kind of okay. So the rate of change then becomes this term, delta x goes to zero, f of x minus f of x plus delta x. Now what I'm going to do is reverse the terms, and that's not going to make any mathematical difference, because m equals y1 minus y2 over the corresponding x1, x2, which equals y2 minus y1 over the corresponding x2 minus x1. And the reason they don't make a difference is because the mathematics on this will take care of the sign. So I've kind of started, I suppose I should have used y2 uh, first, but it doesn't really matter. So now I'm converting in that form so I can be in accord with standard explanations of the way this guy works. Uh, <clears throat> so what we're going to be doing here is taking a look at this. And uh, I've now added my x plus delta x to represent the second point on the curve. This would be the, the higher one, and I'm going to subtract from it the x squared. So that would be in the numerator right here, y2, that would be the higher point, minus the actual point of interest, which would be x squared divided by delta x. So to end up with a meaningful answer here, let's, let's FOIL this term and uh, multiplying that out, the first times the first, the first times the second times two, and the last times the last minus x squared here, divided by delta x. 
And then what I'm going to do is unpack this and uh, combine like terms. And what I see is I've got an x squared and a negative x squared here. So that term will go away. And then in the numerator, I end up with 2x delta x plus delta x squared divided by delta x is expressed right there. Now, this is when things get interesting. As delta x goes to 0, what we have is this term goes to 0, and what we're ending up with is 2x. That's the answer. Now, what does it mean? Well, let's take a look. And uh, if, if you understand the substitution of f of x for one of the y values and f of x plus delta x for the other, you got this. So let's take a look at our parabola and see what the meaning is. Here's our guy. And um, I started out letting x equals uh, 0 here. And uh, let me write down the equation here again, I suppose. Well, here it is. y equals um, x squared. So if um, x is 0, um, y is 0, and the rate of change is 0, and the rate of change, if I elected to draw that using a tangent line, would be right here you see that the slope of that would be equal to zero. So the rate of change, if we had a waveform that looked like this, would be equal to zero. And while I'm here, parabolas, at least a half of this here, is the form of a junction field effect transistor. Um, it also has a relationship for v squared over r and i squared times r, and also for MOSFETs. So parabolas do exist in the electronic world. We're not out in space somewhere in a decoupled math environment. If I let x equal 1, well, y is going to be equal to 1, and the slope is going to be equal to 1. So if I were to, say, put a point right here and draw a tangent through it, we would see that m rise over run is equal to 1. In fact, we x equals 2, y is equal to 4, easy enough. And since our value here uh, that we got from the previous page is 2x, the slope would be equal to 4. Now things get interesting at x equals 3. The value would be 3 squared, which is 9. And the rate of change of that, the slope would be 6. If we have x equals 4, the value would be 16. And the rate of change or slope of that would be 8. Now so far, these slopes have been up and to the right, and that's a positive slope. If we let x equal negative 3, the value is also 9, because it's a squared function, but the slope is going to be negative 6, which means that it would be something like this, which would be going down and to the right. So expanding this out here, if uh, we take a look at this, and these little squigglies mean it's not contiguous based on the origin, x equals 3, y equals 9, the slope of this line right here, m, would be equal to 6. So what we could say at that point right there is this is changing at a rate of 6. And um, if we were to assign this, say, time, and this would be volts, it would be changing at 6 volts per second at exactly that point. If we move it down, the rate of change is going to be smaller because the slope, say, at this point is going to be less and if we move it up past this point, the rate of change is going to be higher because the slope up here is higher. So well, let's look at a, a real part here. And I've drawn a little transistor amplifier, which you may or may not understand, but that's OK. Um, what we're doing is we're amplifying a signal here. And I'm showing an input sine wave. And then at the output, I'm showing that sine wave it's 108 degrees out of phase, which means that the gain of this is going to have a negative number in it. And a negative number, if you think about um, the graph, x and y simply means that you're multiplying the gain by negative 1, which moves it over to the other side, which means it's inverting 180 degrees. No problem with that. Now, to bias this transistor such that it doesn't whack off the top or the bottom, we'll kind of set the bias point here. So it's halfway between 15 volts and 0 volts of ground. So what we have is our sine wave sitting on top of 7.5 volts, and it's deviating up and down relative to that. Now, one of the things that wouldn't be good if we're thinking about a stereo, connecting the output power amp 
which can be an arrangement of transistors or um, these days of powerful integrated circuits, is we don't want to put DC on a speaker cone. And the reason is because it just pushes it out or pulls it in, depending upon the polarity, and that's where it sits, and it's getting hot, and then it moves from there, and the excursion rate of the speaker cone is limited. So what we need to do is get rid of the DC component and hit the speaker with a bipolar signal, say where this pulls the cone in and this pushes the cone out, and then the cone would replicate a sine wave making pressure waves in air that our ears would hear as a sine tone. So how do we get rid of this? And taking a look at the uh, relationship of this, we take the limit as f goes to zero over 2 pi fc. Now, if we graph a capacitor's response, that would be uh, uh, this term here. Um, this would be x sub c on this axis, and actually this would be in negative third quadrant, but I'm not going to worry about that because it's a negative j. It's usually drawn in quadrant one anyhow. So, What we would see is we have two kind of asymptotes here. Um, one is that as f goes to infinity, the numerator goes to zero, and the value of the capacitive reactance xc approaches zero. But for this case, we don't care about that form. What we're going to do is let f go to zero, and zero hertz is represented as direct current. It doesn't change. And then what we're seeing is we're picking up a positive asymptote, and if I put this in limit notation, as f goes to zero, the capacitive reactance xc would be going to infinity. Now, what that means is that the capacitor blocks the DC and lets the AC go through. So the output here is we see the sine wave again, and if we size these values correctly, the value of the sine wave as far as the peaks are concerned will not change. That is, we're not using this as a filter, but a blocking capacitor to get rid of DC components. And the limit here will clearly show you that it will not pass um, the current at F equals zero, or DC. A little bit of a lie. There's a slight, slight bit of leakage involved in here, but we're going to ignore that for the time being. This is the graph of uh, capacitive reactants. And this is the limit that explains why we have the, uh, the property of blocking DC, and we can make it useful. If we had another amplifier stage over here, what we would not want to do, maybe, is put 7.5 on the input of the next stage if we were to need more gain. So that will conclude on limits, and then we'll kind of pick this up and generalize this when we get into polynomial derivatives. So thank you for watching.